good morning, everyone. Let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yeah. Welcome to San Francisco. I know many of you, many of you traveled from far away. Um, so thank you for being here on this sunny April morning. Um, I wanted to start off by thanking the folks outside who can't hear me, but um, <laughs> thank you for being here. Uh, so we've got Maya Scott Chung from Sprout Family. We have Dr. Smichael, Dr. Collins Michael from Laurel Fertility. Um, we have Tommy Harris from World, Brenda Goldhammer from the Clinician Consultation Center, um, Brittany Ferguson and Fergie, um, sorry, Fonzie Silva from Family Builders, and then Laura Lazar from Please Prep Me, as well as Yamini Osagara Bethnagar from Hive. Um, so they will be outside. Feel free to network with them during the break. Some of them have to leave a little bit early, but I believe they'll be leaving their resources. Um, I also want to thank uh, Jessica Price and Amanda Newsetter from the ATC. Thank you so much for helping us put this event on. We really appreciate you. Um, just some logistics. Restrooms are down the hall to the left. Um, feel free to use them whenever you need to. Breakfast will be outside throughout the morning. So if you need to take some lunch, I feel those breakfast burritos are pretty good. Um, take whatever you need. Um, and then slides will be available on hiveonline.org after today. Um, we'll also be recording the sessions on Zoom. So you'll be able to see the slides and the recording and share with your networks who weren't able to be here today. Um, all right, that's it. Thank you. Have fun. We hope you learn a lot today. I want to introduce Shanna Weber from Hive. Good morning. So good to see you guys. Um, I'm going to begin with just a 15 minute or so kind of overview of where we've been so you guys can understand that you're actually at a historic event because so many amazing things have happened and this is perhaps our most diverse event in terms of places people have come from and training and backgrounds of folks in addition to the fact that we have kind of a quasi exhibit hall at a safer conception um, uh, symposium which is pretty exciting but first of all I want to see if we can get some shout outs from where all Places that folks have come. So let's start with who's here from Oakland? Woo! Awesome! <laughs> Berkeley? Yay! Yes! Martinez? Maybe they're still coming? <laughs> Sacramento? Oh my goodness! <laughs> Salinas? Oh, <laughs> Fairfield? They might be on their way. San Rafael? Or North Bay? And then what about San Francisco? Awesome. Um, and then also to talk about the diversity of backgrounds of folks in the room, do we have any pharmacists? Okay, let's just start with the best. Are there any social workers? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, good. The social workers. What about nurses? Are there any nurses? Awesome. Any advocates? Whoop. I mean, I'm hoping. <laughs> what about case managers? Um, and any other? Clinicians. There's practitioners. Awesome. All right, so we're a very diverse group in terms of where we come from and our training. Um, and I am going to tell you a, a love story. And this, this, I love this quote, a love story could begin anywhere. And this love story that I'm going to tell you about started in 2006. At the time, I was working at the National Perinatal HIV Hotline, which is exhibiting out front, the National Clinician Consultation Unit. And we had just started the perinatal HIV hotline connecting women living with HIV who are pregnant with care around the country and also helping clinicians answer questions. And it was in 2006 that I received the first phone call from an HIV negative woman who had an HIV positive male partner and they wanted to have a baby. And I was like, wow, what do we do? So I went to do some research and ask some questions. This couple happened to be in California. And I found out that the law in California banned the use of sperm from a man living with HIV to be used for insemination or for sperm insemination. So basically it was illegal for this couple to get you know, fertility services in California. And in 2006, we didn't really know definitively that treatment as prevention worked. Right, we kind of believed it worked. We'd seen treatment as prevention working in perinatal HIV, but there really was not the scientific evidence that we started to have in, in the, uh, late, even a few years later. And we definitely did not know if PrEP was going to work. So I found some fertility clinics in um, Boise, 
and in Reno. And I'll refer this couple to these clinics. And I remember that this couple very specifically, but then a few other calls started to come in. And so it was suggested to me at the hotline, oh, you know, you should write these cases up. Um, so I started writing these little vignettes. They look like this. And this was like a terribly exciting story for me. And I would turn in my little vignettes and no one would really get that excited about them. That's just one of the themes of this um, event, which is why I, I called today a historic event. And then Deb Cohan worked, Dr. Deb Cohan is the medical director of what is now Hive, um, worked with legislators in Sacramento. And in 2007, uh, the legislature changed the law so that in January 1, 2008, um, it was no longer illegal for a man living with HIV sperm to be used for artificial insemination or sperminization. And one of the heroes, to me is Dr. Collins Michael back there in the back, who's a fertility doctor, who was the first doctor in Northern California who began in January of 2008 to serve couples. And I just want to applaud you. So there were two clinics in Southern California, and he's the only clinic in Northern California that has started. And so I started getting some more phone calls, and so I wrote up some more vignettes, and they all just kind of look like this, right? Lots of referrals for sperm washing. We were still using the term surrogate for a couple. And really, no one cared about these. We would turn these into her, so we would start to tell the story, and it was going nowhere. And then I got terribly excited because I got a call from a New York reporter that she had um, an editor who was interested in publishing a story. So now we're uh, in late 2008. And so I began talking with some of the couples who had called me to see if they would share their story. And at first, really, no one was interested. But lots of conversations with the reporter, lots of conversations with the couples, and eventually a couple decided to come forward and tell their story using assumed names. And over the course of a year and a half, this reporter talking with clinicians around the country, talking with the several couples, uh, she took her story to the editor and the editor said, this story isn't really that relevant. It's not gonna matter to that many people and it didn't get published. So by then, I had uh, almost 100 calls to the hotline and in what I knew from the CCSF academic world, like if something matters, you're gonna submit an abstract. And I submit this abstract and it gets accepted to this conference, the prevention conference. And my program didn't really have money for me to go, but my boss said she'd have to stand by the poster. So she stood by the poster at the conference and she said, the only people who came by were your friends. I don't really think anyone cares about this. Okay, people kept calling me. And then here, 2012 International AIDS Conference, submitted the abstract, it got accepted, and this is like the pinnacle of my career. I got five minutes and three slides, and I have lived for this moment, and I was so sure the entire world would change and everyone would care about this topic. I present, this is the, the sad thing, this is like all seven years of work, it turned out looking like this. <laughs> and one, I got amazing feedback from Pietro Bernaza that the science wasn't really right. That was a big, you know, ego. Deflator. And then, second person to the microphone, I'm a woman living with HIV. Why do you call me Sarah Discord? And my, couple, my husband and I are not discordant. You know, so great feedback about the language, but it was like, mm. so great learning experience. And for me, anti climatic, because this was not the love story that I had known and lived for seven years, right? And so that summer, we uh, also got some funding from the Macy's Foundation, which I want to call them out as heroes. So in 2012, Macy's Foundation funded a program for men living with HIV who have sex with women and want to have babies. And the experience at the International AIDS Conference in seven years of being told that this story didn't matter, you know, this didn't matter, and this funding, I start to shift my idea of thinking it's not about the data and it's about telling the stories because that is what made me fall in love with this topic and want to find out how many ways people could have babies. <laughs> And so with the funding from the Macy's Foundation, we launched an initiative at 46. Hive was then called BayPAC, the Bay Area Perinatal AIDS Center. How many people remember that? How many people are around for BayPAC? <laughs> awesome. And so Guy Vandenberg and I, thank goodness we got to meet. Because what would my life be without you? Anyway, so Guy Vandenberg and I, and this is the genius of Deb Cohan as well, um, started doing focus groups to learn what do men know about having babies, not having babies, disclosure, all in preparation so that we could make a video. Because the idea was if we can start telling the story and showing the faces behind it and helping lift people's stories up, then maybe we could change practices. Um, and we were able to see their HIV negative partners at BayPAC through an arrangement with the um, 
with the city and county of San Francisco. And so from these focus groups, and then we also did some thought leader interviews with providers to really try and understand where we were with the data. Because if you remember, this is when the first PrEP trial came out for men who have sex with men, and we believe that it would work also for women. It was before the, the, the PrEP trials that didn't work for women because of non-adherence had come out. So it was the high time of PrEP for women. Um, and we also had this, even though the data had come out about treatment as prevention, people weren't talking about it like they do today, but we still had this belief, at least in this little world we were working in, that treatment was also an option for prevention. And so we learned some amazing things from the focus groups, which is mostly how isolated and how left out men had been, how little they'd been asked about whether or not they wanted to have a child. Um, we also learned about what a struggle it is for them to disclose that they wanted to have a baby and there was really no space for that. Um, and so in December 2012, we had a, the first video that came out that started to change the story. And for me, really shifting that narrative from one of permission giving, which is still really the way the guidelines goes about it, but I think all of us had operated in that permission giving mode to really talking about possibility, right, and hope, like restoring hope and dignity, but also showing how many options there were for people, the options which have only expanded over time. Um, and so from 2012 to 2015, um, I, oh, the, 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 the making of the movies went so well. It was very powerful. They started making a lot of movies. This is just a funny movie, uh, making movies on iPhones. And this is like George Lewis, who was our administrative assistant, kneeling on Deb Cohen's Crocs because his knees were hurting from filming for so long while we would take and take and take these videos on um, iPhone movies. And we worked a lot trying to advocate to get very small changes each time in the guidelines. We would do this through writing at a, you know, letters to the editor when things were incorrect um, and starting, you know, email chains that had lots of opinions that would get forwarded to people. Um, and this is a video of how to use a female condom, not necessarily related to safer conception, but I thought you would like seeing that vagina on a workbench. <laughs> um, during this time, we made a lot of brochures and our first brochures were translated by the Mission Neighborhood wellness center into Spanish. We had students from a high school, the Gold Ring High School, who came in and made videos and, and translated brochures into Spanish as well. Lots of residents and fellows who came through who helped make the brochures. We did an early educational event with the AETC um, to, for providers to, to start talking about what we learned from some provider surveys. Um, and we had two, during that time, there was two news articles that came out that were about safer conception itself. Um, a lot of news articles started to come out about PrEP and they would include safer conception as an option, but they really didn't have that rights-based approach that you got with these two safer conception stories. And one was on the front page of the Chronicle and one was on the front page of the Washington Post. So you start to see how these stories in the mainstream media also shift this narrative. And at this time now, BayPAC had grown from Bay Area Perinatal Aid Center, um, we needed to really rebrand and have a way to tell our story of our work we were doing with men and safer conception in, in a different way. And so here's, um, as we're reimagining what our mission might be, and in early 2015, on Women and Girls HIV AIDS Awareness Day, we rebranded as Hive. And with Hive, we were able to reimagine ourselves as a, have a positive reproductive and sexual health and share these very diverse stories that we had now, and, and resources that we had now collected. In late 2015, early 2017, um, the San Francisco story also mirrored a global story that was happening about safer conception, and we joined with colleagues around the globe and started a movement called Global Share, which is housed on Hive as well. And this brings clinicians and advocates and researchers from around the world together, also talking about from a very rights-based and person-centered perspective, um, safer conception options. This group, with this group this last year, we published a consensus statement, really with a global perspective, um, but again, with that very rights-based perspective about advancing um, reproductive and uh, sexual health options for people who are living with and affected by HIV. And then this last, August, one of the most amazing things happened is that the CDC updated their state for conception guidelines, overturning uh, uh, their guidelines from 1998. So they've been sitting there from 1998 banning the use of, or really basically saying you could only do in vitro fertilization. And they came up with this beautiful statement, which I'm going to pull this last line, um, that 
covers all of the different options that couples might use and really then calls on clinicians to consider factors such as risk tolerance, personal health costs, and access, and helping couples make the best decisions for their personal situations. <clears throat> So now we are Hive. We have a clinic on Tuesdays at San Francisco General Hospital where we see live, live people who are um, pregnant and, and, in a, and who are affected by H, HIV. Um, it's a multidisciplinary clinic. All of our amazing folks are in the room. You'll hear from Monica in a little bit, but our social worker Becca is here as well. And we also have a reproductive health clinic that's once a month at Ward 86 that Guy and I run and Guy will be presenting in a little bit, you will learn a little bit more about that. And this is a nice place for people to come to kind of do, get the basic information. We do a lot of talking about disclosure and going over what all the options are and then what are next steps for following up on those options depending on your situation. Um, the Hive online website has gobs of resources and our brochures are being updated by Yamini right now. Um, and they will be then translated into Spanish and they're being updated to really lead more with the treatment as prevention or U equals U languaging, which has kind of shifted over time. And here's a picture of the awesome the, um, program team that's doing that work. And here's all the amazing brochures. This last brochure that's on the top is a brochure that we were made with Positive Force at San Francisco AIDS Foundation. And it's a brochure for men who are living with HIV who might want to have a child with a same sex partner through surrogacy or a single parent by choice. And this was such an amazing, beautiful experience. And the Hive blog, which Krishna had put up some of the stories, you saw them on the screens. The Hive blog is just the most amazing place to land and find these beautiful stories of love and triumph and people making um, the, their families and lives the way that they want to. Super inspiring, great to be able to go there with people who are considering having a baby or not. There's all, that's also a beautiful story, and being able to see this diversity of experiences. So really, this has been a journey that has brought us to this day. And I, this road shows you lots of switchbacks because there's been lots of ups and downs. The themes for me of this journey are about change, the change that's happened in the science, but the change that's also happened in the way we focus on people and their desires. And it's the change that comes with the learning, always being open to learning. So I'm so thrilled today that Jenna will be with us and pr presenting a trans-inclusive framework so we can all take that learning, you know, just one step further. And it's also been a story of incredible collaboration. So I've mentioned some of the folks throughout, but Keiko and Maya, who's out front, helped us develop the trans feminine and trans masculine safer conception brochures about two years ago. As well and I actually wanted to shout out because I think there's so many people in the room who have so I want you to raise your hand if you've done one of these things if you've written a blog for Hive you can raise your hand if you've attended one of our previous community or provider events if you've referred a patient to reproductive health clinic or to Hive you've participated in one of our focus groups you've been in a video You've been a speaker at an event talking about your safer conception story or how you help patients with it. Um, you fill out our provider survey or you've been one of the many people who's reviewed our materials. How many people raised their hand during that? So look at this, it's all of us, right? So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. I look forward to seeing how this story continues to evolve in the coming five and 10 years. And when we look back and be able to see all of this that we've been able to do together. So thank you for being here today. All right, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Jenna Roquez from the Center of Excellence for Transgender Health. Welcome, Jenna. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, so thank you all for having me here. Um, originally, it's just